I do pray, Lord, as we enter into this time of looking into your word, that there will be a reality in us through what we hear, what we share, that will cause us, Lord, to be greater in faith, greater in reach, more loving and caring than we have ever been. In Jesus' name, use me, Lord, as your servant today to bless your people with the powerful word that you have led me in this week. Amen and amen. I got this line earlier in the week, and I keep saying it to myself multiple times every day. When God is for you, no one can stand against you. Why don't you say it with me? When God is for you, no one can stand against you. It has been common knowledge among Christ followers for a long time that when God is for you, it won't do any good for anyone to be against you. That's not saying no one will be against you, just that they won't last long in their adversarial stance. They don't have a chance against the God who created you and the universe that you live in. I know that we say there are no guarantees in life, but trust in the God of heaven is as close as it gets. Might not always get what I want, but I always get what he gives me. And I'm thankful for that. The outcome of all of life is not dependent upon medical science. We thank God for doctors. We thank God for medicine. And it's certainly not dependent upon faith. You know, some people think faith is the thing. It was just going to happen no matter what. I promise you that many people have prayed prayers that kept them from something that was going to happen. And that process can be repeated. Simply put, I believe life is dependent upon our faith and our trust in the God of heaven who created us and watches over us every day of our lives. Out of this lesson today, I want to impress upon you, stamp it indelibly into your consciousness that when God is for you, it won't do, as my mother would say, a dab of good for anyone to be against you. As a matter of fact, there will be penalty and consequence for anyone who tries to interrupt God's plan for your life. Amen. In the book of Joshua, chapter 2, the history, or the story rather, of the conquest of Jericho by the nation of Israel begins. It signals the end of Israel's wandering and the beginning of establishing a homeland. Now fast forward to the present day and Israel is under attack like maybe she's not been before. But I, I got news for you. They can't win because these are God's people. These are his chosen people. Not, not just any people, his chosen people. In, in this chapter, Joshua chapter 2, again, it signals the end of Israel's wandering and the beginning of establishing a homeland. 
This was a very important season of the fledgling nation of Israel. Their movement of obedience to God in this scriptural story opened the door to their future. What happened here is still working for Israel to the present day. Many people have tried to wipe them out, and they just keep coming back. You remember the old rubber or plastic blow-up clown? You knock him down, and he comes right back. You hit him and flatten him out, and he just bounces right back. Well, Israel is just like that. You might hit them hard, but they're going to bounce right back. Why? Because they're God's people. Jericho was the most important city in the Jordan Valley and the strongest fortress in all the land of Canaan. Israel was right there in Joshua chapter 2. They're right there. This, this place was the key to western Palestine. The conquest they were on led them to where we find them in Joshua chapter 2. Their history is a testimony to the truth I want to convey to you today that when God is for you, like Mama would say, it ain't going to do a dab of good for nobody to be against you. The name Jericho means place of fragrance. It was a fenced or walled city in the midst of a vast grove of palm trees in the plains of Jordan over against the place where the river Jordan was covered or crossed rather by the Israelites. All the inhabitants and all the spoil of the city were to be destroyed. Only the silver and the gold and the vessels of brass and iron were reserved and put into the treasury of the house of Jehovah. And only Rahab and her father's household and all that she had were preserved from destruction, according to the instruction given to the spies who were sent there. She, Rahab, had protected them when they came to spy out the land, which was saving grace for her and her entire household. Think about that. What she did saved her entire family from destruction. I want to read verses 1 and 2 of chapter 2 of Joshua, and here's what it says. Now Joshua the son of Nun sent out two men from Acacia Grove to spy secretly, saying, Go view the land, especially Jericho. So they went and came to the house of a harlot named Rahab and lodged there. And it was told the king of Jericho, saying, Behold, men have come here tonight from the children of Israel to search out the country. How did the person who told the king know about the spies of Israel? It was an interesting question to me. Lest we forget there are two forces at work in our world of faith. God, the God of heaven, the God over this earth, He's for us. And when He's for you, it won't do a dab of good for anybody to be against you. Everybody say dab. That's a little bit. It won't do any good. It won't even do a great amount of good for anybody to be against you. Because God's for you. Well, Israel is right there. The God of heaven was for them. But Satan, the enemy of their souls and the enemy of God, was against them. Here's another question that I I ask myself. Why did the men go to the house of a harlot? 
why did they go to the house of a harlot? Well, I don't know what you're thinking. I don't know that I want to tell you what I'm thinking. But they went there. Most likely, this place, Rahab's house, was the most frequented place in the city. This is the way a pastor's mind works when he's preparing a sermon. That means it was also most likely passed over by the upstanding citizens of Jericho. They wouldn't go there. Jesus said, those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick. But go and learn what this means. I desire mercy and not sacrifice. For I did not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. Rahab played an important role in the coming of a Messiah named Jesus Christ. She played a very important role. People who think they are not in need of saving grace from God are sadly mistaken. And the biggest reason why is because self-righteousness is deceiving. And whoever is deceived by self-righteousness is not a wise person. The name Jericho means, again, place of fragrance. It was a city just over the Jordan in the land of Canaan. It was the first city that was taken and destroyed by the Israelites after they entered the promised land. Here's the beautiful thing about Rahab's efforts. She, 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 could, she could have been the savior of her people, but... They rejected God's plan for them and suffered total loss. But not all was lost because Rahab and her household were saved from destruction. Family is important, my friend. We have more than one son. We have two sons. And we have daughters in love. And we have five of the greatest grandsons that ever lived. I, I borrowed that from my wife. <laughs> and we pray for them every day. Not because we have fear that they're not walking with God, but because we know God can hear our prayers, and will answer them as we cry out to Him on behalf of our family. And here's what I believe about our family. That both of our sons, their wives, and their children, their five sons, my twin grandsons, and my three other grandsons, are going to be saved. And I speak that by faith in the God of heaven who rose up on behalf of Rahab and her family in this story and believe for the salvation of my children. God makes a way for people when there just doesn't seem to be a way because He's God. And he can do that. And it won't do a dab of good for anybody to stand in the way of it. God has saved Israel time after time from national destruction because they were his chosen people and still are. The message of Gilgal to Israel is a perpetual testimony that the reproach of Egypt is rolled away. Why is that important? Because they were in slavery in Egypt. 
And when they came to Gilgal, this place where they're at now, that reproach was rolled away. They didn't act like slaves anymore. They didn't cower to anyone. And guess what? They still don't cower to anyone. People shoot rockets into Israel. They fire bigger rockets back. You know, I wish war didn't happen, but the devil is still alive and at work. And thank God for the people of God, Israel and the church of the Lord Jesus Christ, that great things are still happening in our world, especially the salvation of lost people. Egypt was what was. You know, they were there, they were in bondage, but God delivered them miraculously and set them free. Now, Canaan is what is. Canaan is what is. R remember the old phrase, monkey see, monkey do? Well, the best answer I can give to you regarding the actions of the Israelite men in going to the house of a harlot, is they were acting upon the wisdom and direction of God as men of God. Now you say, Pastor, you keep going back to that point. Well, it bothered me. I'm a Christian pastor. I don't go to places like that. It kind of bothered me. Why did God send them to the house of a woman of ill repute? The short answer to the question is that God directed them to the house of Rahab the harlot. Perhaps the rest of the story will fill in the blanks about her role in this historical happening for this fledgling nation of Israel. Acacia Grove was the last place the Israelites camped before crossing the barrier of the Jordan River. It was also the place where Israel began to have relations they shouldn't have been having with Moabite women. The women invited them to the sacrifices for their gods, and guess what? The Israelites drank the Kool-Aid. They bowed in worship to those gods, which angered the Lord, and something terrible happened. He killed 24,000 of them. You think God's serious about people obeying Him? I do. Grace intervened. This, this massacre stopped when Phinehas, son of Eleazar, son of Aaron the priest, stepped in and brought it to an end. It just makes me want to tell you that men of God still need to take their stand today and stand up against a destroying enemy that is taking away our children, our grandchildren, even our great-grandchildren. To fully understand Micah's valuable metaphor that he uses, one must know that Acacia Grove was also the last place the Israelites camped before crossing the Jordan River, the geographical division, dividing line between their existence as homeless runaway slaves from Egypt on their way to a promised land. Gilgal was the site of their first night after the crossing. There they celebrated so they went from a place marked by sin, deception, treachery, and death to a place marked by celebration for their deliverance and the provision of a new home in the span of a few miles. Think about that. Just a few miles. A little ways back, they were questioning, wondering, what are we doing? Now they know. Not just what they're doing, but where their homeland is. And they're there. We have all lived 
shackled by chains at times of our sins. Our backs were scarred from the consequences of our decisions. We were marked for death by the enemy of our souls. And we were betrayed by one, that same enemy, who is the father of lies. We have wandered in the darkness of spiritual oblivion, only to have a great deliverer and teacher come to our aid. He, Jesus, has provided a way of escape for us and is leading us even now to a promised land. I thought I'd get at least an amen out of that. I know you're spellbound. Who has more cause for celebration than the ransomed, the redeemed? No one. This should lead us to offering sacrifices of just, humble living to our God. We should never pull back from God's rod of discipline, knowing that He ordained it for our good and not our calamity. The journey from Acacia Grove to Gilgal was short but incredibly significant. The journey from one's head, that place of intellectual ascent, to the existence and demands of Christ, to one's heart. Submissive yielding to those words of wisdom and instruction He delivers to us. That's a short distance from there to there. But if it doesn't get here, it will not have the desired effect that the person wants it to have. Many people do not make it. It never goes from here to here. You know, one of the things that grounds me in my sermon preparation and in my ministry as a pastor is the fact that I know I am still human. I may preach and sometimes you may feel like it's heaven. But the truth is, it's delivered from a man of the earth whom God has called and anointed. I have no question about that. I've had people to question it. And it doesn't matter to me. They didn't call me. God did, and I heard it. And for over 40 years now, I've been taking this gospel everywhere I could and preaching it. And that's not all. I believe what it says. I believe every jot and every tittle of God's Word that is in this book. I believe it. It's proven to me over time that it has within it the message and hope of eternity. Amen. That's not in my notes, so I'll finish up the notes and we'll pray. And believe God that He's going to do something in us and with us. Many people do not make it to their own peril because they don't accept, they don't embrace, they don't believe what the book says, and they don't believe in the Savior that the book is all about. Those who do, Know the joy this world will never experience. And those who don't will answer to Him for the life that He gave them, which they never put under 
his control. Would you bow your heads with me and let's contemplate for a moment the thought of this lesson today that when God is for you, no one can stand against you. No one. I don't know what personal battles you are fighting right now. Could be family issues. In our world today, it's not uncommon for neighbors to fight against neighbors. It's not uncommon for the government to step in and try to tell you, you can't do what you have a perfect right to do on your own property. There's so many things that are happening in our world, and especially in this nation today, that are so unlike our history. But God is still God, and God is still in control. And God will bless His people to always be able to stand up for Him, no matter what. No matter what. So, Father, I thank you today for this word. Help us to remember this, that when you are for us, it won't do anyone else any good to be against us. Because we're going to soar. We're going to fly. We're going to wear that smile and treat people right and do your will above all things in this world. I pray for your people, Lord, that the joy and beauty of your presence and wonderful power will become so real, so real, Lord, that the joy and the excitement of it is not containable. May it break out on us, Lord, like the dawning of a new day. Let us be refreshed in your presence, Lord, to be a refresher to others who need to know they're loved and cared for, need to know again someone to remind them that heaven is only a breath away. Oh God, in Jesus' name, bless your people today. In Jesus' name, use us for your glory and for your honor. In Jesus' name. If you hold out your hands, I want to bless you before I say the final amen. May the blessing of the Lord our God be there to meet you where you are going. May His face be radiant with joy just watching over you. And may His peace go before you. May it guard you from your blind side and keep you in His way. May the hope of your future in Him stir the energies of your strength and creativity and lead you on until you stand in His presence forever and ever. Amen. Amen. And God bless you. The only thing I ask of you is fellowship with people before you go. And thank you so much for being here today. You are dismissed.